Welcome back to the cardinalsports.com recruiting chat. My name is Dave Lackford. I'm the recruiting analyst for Louisville Football and the Rival site, and we're here to answer any questions that the subscribers may have on the 2021 Louisville Football recruiting class. So let's get right into it. I'm going to share my screen, and I am going to answer the questions that you all have posted on the board. First question is, so what's up with Travion Ford? If you don't know, Travion Ford is a six foot three, two hundred and twenty pound defensive end out of St. Louis. Um, he is down to unofficially three schools: Missouri, Louisville, and Illinois. Um, and people want to know what's going on with him because people over there on the other site have predicted that he's going to go to Missouri. So we'll run the film while I talk about this kid. Um, so what I've been hearing <clears throat> is that people have been in contact with his high school coach and his prediction is that he's probably going to end up at Missouri. From what I've heard, uh, Missouri wants to use him as an every down defensive end, whereas Louisville sees him more as a guy who they'll move around as a, a pass rusher who may come out of the game uh, in run situations. Now um, that's just now, you know, going forward, that may change as players' bodies change uh, with some time in the nutrition program and a weight program and things of that nature. But um, from what I'm hearing, it's kind of like he thinks he gets more valuable film uh, when he's on the field for, you know, the full three snaps. But that's not necessarily always the case. Um, it's more or less how you're used. If you're not, you know, if you're just out there two gap and that really doesn't blow scouts away, um, you know, if you're just setting the edge, keeping your outside shoulder free, turning the, you know, turning the running, the running plays back into the middle of the defense. I mean, if you can't do that, what are we talking about? Louisville wants to use him more in a pass rushing situation where, you know, he's getting those, those money snaps where you're getting to the quarterback, taking him down and blowing up the whole offensive strategy. Um, but, you know, Missouri is the home school, um, the head coach out there, Eli Drinkowitz. He's been doing a pretty good job since he took over. He's uh, won some pretty big recruiting battles already. So, you know, it's, it's tough to get a kid out of St. Louis that has his mind set on going home. But that information that um, has predicated all of these predictions isn't straight from the horse's mouth, so to say. It's, it's from the head coach. But uh, his name's Carl Reed, and he's pretty much been the point man for a lot of people in this recruitment. So – you know, take it with a grain of salt, but it looks like right now Missouri is in a better spot than Missouri, than Louisville or Illinois. That's not going to stop Louisville from recruiting him. Uh, he's obviously the, the number one target there for the defensive ends, and I think that will continue even if he's committed elsewhere. But right now, you know, the way that I, I'm hearing things, it looks like, you know, his coach thinks he's going to Mizzou. Um, he's a kid who seems to really like the recruiting process, and I have not reached confirmation on whether or not a decision is imminent. So that's, that's to be seen right now. But it looks like the way things are trending through the, the gossip mill is uh, Mizzou is the team to beat. Now, he was supposed to take official visits to Missouri, Louisville, and Illinois. So even if he does make an early commitment during, you know, this, this time frame where we're all, you know, on shutdown orders and we're all staying in our homes and we can't visit, nobody can visit these schools, you know, something to watch going forward if they're able to get him on campus or if he does commit, does he still go out and take his official visits? So even if it's, even if he commits, I don't think it's over. Um, who's the best under the radar prospect Louisville is recruiting? Uh, under the radar, that's a, a broad term, can mean a bunch of different things. To me, an underrated player um, that Louisville is recruiting is Ben Perry. And this is Ben Perry's film right here. Ben is probably going to be a guy who plays the card position for Louisville. He's this says 6'2, 195. I don't know if he really is 195, but from what I heard, um, Ben comes from a big family, and uh, there's a rush to the dinner table. So what that means is uh, he, he, he once you get him on campus and uh, get the right nutritionist involved with him, you're going to see uh, him put a lot more weight on his frame. Now, um, Isaiah Simmons is a similar type of player who came out of um, high school, wasn't a highly ranked kid. 
ends up going to Clemson, and he was about 6'3", 200 pounds. Uh, obviously, he put about another 25 pounds on his frame, moved a linebacker for uh, Clemson and played a multitude of positions. He'd line up at safety. He'd line up at nickel corner. He'd line up at inside, outside linebacker. Just like a bigger honey badger, you know, and that's a guy who really helped his draft status, and he's probably going to be a top five pick in the draft tomorrow. So uh, Louisville sees Benjamin Perry in that kind of mold. He's a kid that, you know, isn't necessarily uh, a traditional safety, but he's also not like a traditional outside linebacker. He's a hybrid type of player that they're going to move around. And that's kind of what the card position is in Louisville's defense. So um, he's a kid who I, I think has the growth potential to really become like a, a five-star frame kind of guy who could go high in the NFL draft. So that's a kid to keep an eye on for sure. Louisville feels like they're confident in him. Uh, some of the other people I talk to around the network think that, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely a Illinois. Illinois is in the mix. Um, but from what I get from the Louisville side of things, the staff is very confident they can land him. They really like what he's about. There's good communication between the two parties. Um, and the fit in the Louisville defense is something that um, Perry really has found attractive during this process. So I think Ben Perry is your under-the-radar guy who could really be a dude who steps in right away, gets really good film, and you just see him see his draft status kind of take off and would actually bolster this Louisville defense from that from that card position. Okay, so Ben Perry is the guy that you want to watch out for going forward in this class. He is uh, an essential piece to what Louisville is trying to do. All right, so the next question is from Burge the Word. So he says, if Dingle goes to Cincinnati, is Gavin Barthill a possibility? Really love his film. If not, who are some others to look at? All right, so multi-part question the first thing if dingle goes to cincinnati i have it on pretty good authority that um jack dingle 2021 three-star linebacker out of trinity is going to commit to cincinnati on saturday that's what i'm hearing um things change fast but right now um that's the word and i switched my pick from louisville to cincinnati for jack dingle Gavin Barthiel is a possibility um they want to take two inside linebackers he's probably 1B, um, and he's a take because they're taking two. So if he wanted to jump on board, they'll take Gavin. But the guy that um, they, the staff is really high on is Jaden Hood. All right, now Jaden Hood is a middle linebacker from Florida. He is a guy that the staff has been very high on, uh, as it, most college programs throughout the country are really high on. He's got a huge offer list. Um, in talking to Louisville side of things, they feel like he grew up a Florida State fan, and you know that's a team to watch for him. And of course, Miami, Florida, um, Notre Dame is a team that he really likes as well. He's he's really one of the big dogs in this class, and he would be a huge get for Louisville. So the average Louisville fan will instantly think, once I name those guys. Um, you're going to say, well, there's no way we're getting this kid. You know, we got these blue bloods out there. But relationships are key, and this staff does a good job with relationships. Now, the people I talk to feel very, very good. Like, they have a really, really legitimate shot at Jaden Hood, and Louisville is one of the top schools on his list. And that's because his uncle on his mom's side, his mom's brother, is Lovey Jenkins, who's a 2020 commits head coach. Um, and they're, they're very tight and they have nothing but good things to say about Louisville. Um, Lovey is having a good time here and has really, really been selling Louisville to, um, Hood, uh, as has Jaden's mom. Jaden's mom really likes Louisville. And of course, you know, uh, Jaden's uncle, who is Lovey Jenkins coach also has been singing the praises of Louisville. So they got a legit shot and this is their number one target at linebacker, maybe their number one target on the board, period, right now. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me with the caliber of recruit he is and the, the national attention that he's getting. So Louisville's really preaching that he could come in day one, take over for Dorian Etheridge, kind of, you know, make that 
impact, get on the freshman all American list, you know, just be the guy here. And um, I, I think he's been receptive to that. He was supposed to visit in March. He never made the trip, of course, because the whole world shut down, but the staff is still in contact with him. And, you know, things, things are looking good for him. Uh, Gavin Barthiel is another really good linebacker prospect. I've shown his film on here. He's from Lake Gibson down in Lakeland, Florida. And um, he's definitely a guy to watch going forward as well. Like I said, I think that um, Hood and Barthiel are the two guys that Louisville is really looking forward to uh, landing out here. They're probably at the top of the board. Uh, that's just me kind of reading the tea leaves here. But they really like him. He could do a lot of different things. He's a versatile player. You see him on special teams running down the field, knocking dudes' heads off. That's what you want to see. Uh, the staff really thinks that he has the type of mentality that they like on this team. He's a, a you know a dude who doesn't have a huge ego and just does what you're supposed to do, does what he's asked to do, put in the yeoman's work, if you will. So um, look for him going forward as a major target, and uh, that's that's. <clears throat> a guy who I think can also step in right away um, and contribute early, maybe not so much as like the guy, but definitely in different situations. He's a good depth dude, and you'll see him down there on special. You'll see him out on special teams trying to wreak havoc on people. So I, I do think that Barthiel is a legitimate target, and I think he's a legitimate option both sides have good communication with one another he goes to uh Bilal Powell um actually went to uh Barthiel's high school Lake Gibson and um I spoke with Barthiel you know and the whole the plan was to get Barthiel up here on a visit and have Bilal Powell come in and kind of talk to him about you know what it's like to live in Louisville go to the school how the fans are etc cetera, etc cetera. and he's very open to that so he's a guy that's a possibility that um, I, I, there's a legit shot for, and you want to kind of keep your focus on him moving forward at the inside linebacker position. But uh, from what I understand, the Dingle thing is over. He's going to Cincinnati just like his father and his brother before him. Cardinal Cash wants to know the question that everybody always wants to know, who's the next commit to jump on board? Any thoughts on black backup plans at middle linebacker? Just answered that question for you. Um, and D end, if we don't get Ford and Dingle. Um, well, I think a guy that Louisville likes um, at kind of like D end outside linebacker type of position as an edge rusher would be uh, Wes Weeks. Um, Wes is from, um, I don't know how to say that. He's from Georgia. Let's just put it that way. Um, he's, he's a guy that Louisville is really high on that they really want. You see his measurables there at 6'2", 215. Um, kind of similar to Travion Ford. Travion's about 6'3", 215. Two, he told me 220. You know, when a kid tells me his size, you know, I kind of go with the, go, go, go with like a five, five pound margin of error on that. But you see West here, he's, a, he's an athletic kid. He could do a lot of different things. Um, so he's a guy to watch. Um, Braylon Wood from Colorado is another dude that uh, could possibly commit soon to Louisville. Um, I, I think that he's a take. So watch out for him. He could play, you know, five tech all the way down to, to one or zero even if he adds some bulk. Zero is, you know, lining up straight up in front of the center. And a five tech is a guy who lines up straight up in front of the tight end or outside of the tackle. Um, so he's versatile. Louisville likes his versatility. And I know that his father is big on Louisville. Um, when he was there on the visit, his father reached out to me, said, where should I go get some food? I told him, you know, go to Indies. Uh, he enjoyed it. Told me <laughs> it was a good pick. So uh, credit to me on that. But um, the end is kind of wide open. I think Travion Ford is the guy that I'm looking for right now. They, they've got a, a few other names uh, on the defensive end side of things that they like, but the, the primary focus right now is Travion Ford. But Wes Weeks is a guy who could come in and play that outside linebacker who could possibly beef up and, and stick his hand in the dirt. I don't know. I think to me, he, he's more suited for outside linebacker, but you know, 
that's the kid that you need to watch going forward. I think who could be a, a commitment prospect. Another kid who was supposed to commit to Louisville but didn't um, was uh, Derek Edwards. Derek Edwards plays uh, – he's from Florida. He plays uh, DN, or cornerback. And I had everything ready to go for him. I had quotes from him. He was supposed to commit last week um, after a virtual visit. But I think um, – in our in our talk, you know, he said he was going to take official visits to all five schools, and, and I think you know once that kind of sunk in to him, he was like, "Well, let's not go ahead and, and make this decision right now." Sort of like a placeholder. Let me make sure that this is actually where I want to go. And if he's planning on taking all five visits, I don't I don't think that's so bad. I mean, it's logical. Why commit somewhere if you're still planning on keeping your recruitment open? And taking all five of your visits, right? But as you can see, you know, he's a playmaker. <coughs> he does some good things. He's, he's uh, definitely a take for Louisville. So if he wants to jump on board, I think that uh, they'll definitely take his commitment. But we'll see. Um, we'll see. And that's my answer to your question, sir. <coughs> Derek Edwards, he's a guy to watch going forward. He's from Miami. Um, so, you know, and, and when a Miami kid commits this early, you know, it's kind of like, well, is he really committed anyway? You know, Miami dudes, they, they, they got some stuff with them. Sometimes they'll, they'll commit and they'll flip two, three times. You know, Ronald uh, Darcy, Dancy from last year, he ended up at Nebraska. He was a kid from Miami Northwestern. You know, the Miami kids, man, they're, they're, they're a different breed down there. So, but as far as the next commit to jump on board, I don't know. But I'm sure I'll talk on some other kids later on in the chat who probably are, are leaning towards Louisville, and, and maybe they could be the next commitment. Okay, so Jay Hectus says, if we are recruiting like this, virtual visits, no campus, et cetera, until games begin, how does this set staff close on guys they need to land? Well, Jay, I'll tell you, man, if I knew that question, I'd be on the staff and I'd be closing on guys they need to land, you know. Um, I guess you wait it out and hopefully you can get them on campus. Um, or, you know, it's a tough question. I don't really know how to answer that, to be honest. Um, maybe you recruit guys who other teams aren't really pushing for and you just kind of make them feel like they're the priority. Um there's, there's a million tactics to get kids to commit, but the question is, do you want to use a tactic to get a kid to commit now just so that they can reopen up and decommit later? Um, you, you land on signing day, and here we are in you know mid -April, well, late April uh, with a pandemic going on. So uh, I don't think anybody's necessarily closing on guys right now. You close in December, you close in February. Right now, I think, you know, the, the foundations are being laid and, and that's what they're more focused on than actually closing right now. There's some teams out there that have a lot of commitments, but once once things open up again and, and people are able to get back on campus, you're going to see those things change rapidly. So it's, it's too early. It's too early in the process to talk about closing. You know, when I think of closers, I think of people like, like uh, Bobby Bobby Bowden down in Florida State who used to pull a bunch of guys on signing day. Dudes like uh, Charlie Strong was a great closer. He was a dude that would pull in dudes at the end of the cycle. Um, those are the guys I think of closers, and closing kind of happens on national signing day as far as I'm concerned. Now, <clears throat> just uh, Lake Boy 25 thinks he really likes Gavin Barthiel. He really stands out to him. You know, he stands out to the coaching staff, too, because he's one of the top inside linebacker prospects that they are targeting. Now, Bill Underwood, 2020, joined Thursday. Welcome aboard, Bill. Thanks for signing up. Uh, Bill asks, seen Kiner. Oh, I got confirmation that it's Corey Kiner, not Kinner. So Corey Kiner is committing July 4th. That's correct. That's what he stated. Still looking good for Louisville. And what is the point of committing right now when there is a chance kids could visit for real in maybe a couple of months? Okay. So, yes, he's committing July 4th. Still looking good for Louisville? Yes. Josh Helmholt, he put an article up yesterday shortly after, Bill, after you asked this question. Um, and he, he talked about Louisville more than anybody else in the article. He's visited four times already. He has 
been to. So to answer your question, what's the point of committing now when there's a chance kid could visit for real in maybe a couple of months? Kiner's visited for real in the past four times. So I think if he's going to pick anybody right now, I think it's going to be Louisville. Um, I was told by some sources that uh, it was a Louisville-Michigan battle. I was also told Cincinnati's in the mix because uh, he's from Cincinnati. But right now, I, I think he's going to choose Louisville on July 4th. Um, but then again, it's April 23rd or whatever, the day, 22nd. So who knows? But right now, Louisville's looking good for him. And I think that uh, if he was to commit today, it would be to Louisville. However, he's not committing today. He's committing on July 4th. Um, in general, to answer your question, what's the point of committing now when there's a chance kids could visit for real maybe a couple of months? Well, the answer to that is always the staff is the staff is looking at multiple players at your position, right? So let's say you are a six foot, 190 pound cornerback and you're trying to commit to Minnesota, okay? And Minnesota is looking for two guys like you and they get a guy like you to commit at one of the cornerback positions. Now they have one more spot open and there's two other guys just like you that Minnesota's recruiting. You're all kind of like even on the board and um, you just want to commit so you can take that spot. So you, you know, Minnesota's really want to, where you want to go. Minnesota's recruiting you the hardest and they're also recruiting these other kids and the staff says something to the effect of, look, look, John, you know, or Bill, look, Bill, you're our number one guy, right? Um, but we got this kid named John who's pretty good, and we like him too. And he's number two. He's right behind you. He's a good player. And, uh, you know, we, we want you. You're our guy. But, you know, I don't think we can go wrong with either one of y'all. And he's he's probably close to popping. So if, if you know, I'm, I'm just letting you know that if he commits, we're not going to have a spot for you anymore. You're going to have to go to your second choice. Those are the type of things that happen, and that's when you see kids jump on now uh, to save a spot. Another reason, I mean, there's many reasons. Another reason could be, you know, kid just wants to go to that school. He's always wanted to go to that school, and he's tired of the recruiting process, and he he gets the green light from the coaching staff to commit and says, you know what, you're a take. You got the requisite ACT and you got the good GPA. You know, come on. So that could be the case. That's what happened maybe with Jansen Dunn. Um, who just committed recently, a couple of days ago. He was supposed to commit, I think, Sunday night. He ended up committing yesterday, or maybe it was the day before, or Monday. But, you know, he was so set to commit to Oklahoma. And from my sources told me that Dunn tried to commit to Ohio State previously. And they kind of told him, you know, hey, hold off a minute. There's no need to jump the gun. Uh, why, don't, why don't you come visit? You know, you know it's get eyes on you at camp again or whatever it may be. I don't know exactly what they told him, but they did tell him, you know what, hold on. And that usually means they got somebody else on their board that they're higher on and, and they're probably trying to target them and get them and wait on them. But um, Jansen Dunn kind of did the opposite situation than what I described earlier when a kid's trying to commit and there's two other dudes like him or, you know, a kid may not be ready to commit, but, the school has three guys at one position. They're all kind of similar. And they tell their number one guy, hey, number two guy is going to jump on board if you don't jump on board. Well, Jansen Dunn was about to commit to Oklahoma. Like he already told Lincoln Riley he was going to commit. And he had tried to commit to Ohio State previously. So whoever was on the Ohio State staff, they got word of his commitment to Oklahoma and said, whoa, 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 don't do that. You know what? Come on in. We'll take you. And that threw a monkey wrench in the whole thing. And then a day or so later, he went ahead and pulled the trigger on Ohio State. So that's where he wanted to go anyway. He tried to commit there. They wouldn't take him. He was ready to shut down his recruitment. I guess he was tired of it. And he just wanted, you know, wanted to pick a school. So he was going to go to Oklahoma. And um, that's how it played out. Now, from what I heard, Louisville was legitimately in the running. However, it was more the parents liked Louisville over the other two schools, over Oklahoma. But Dunn wanted to go play big-time football for a playoff contender. And so he said, you know what, if Ohio State's not going to take me, I'm going to go to Oklahoma. All right? So I think that Louisville is not done recruiting him. As a matter of fact, I'm going to share the screen and go back to a question that was asked. 
about Jansen Dunn is basically the question was, uh, are we going to, are we going to keep, will we continue to recruit Dunn? Unitas Tower, um, something, I don't know. You can read that for yourself, but will we continue to recruit Dunn? Uh, absolutely. I think Louisville will stay on Dunn until they fill up at safety. Um, and who are the other safety prospects? Uh, that would be Jordan Lovett from North Harden. He's a Kentucky kid. Um, he's actually from he's actually from Georgia too, just like Jansen Dunn. He's a Georgia kid who moved to Kentucky. Um, I, I'm assuming an Army brat since you know he's stationed out there by Fort Knox and goes to North Harden. So that's another kid that <clears throat> Louisville's high on. I do know that Kentucky is also high on Jordan Lovin, Love it, and they're recruiting him as well. So one of the questions in one of the previous chats was who in the 2021 class from Kentucky is truly a Louisville Kentucky battle definitely Jordan Lovett free safety out of North Harden who had 13 interceptions last year 13 I know Tennessee is also in the mix they like him a lot um maybe not as much as Kentucky and Louisville go but uh I think the two major competitors there are um West Virginia three actually West Virginia Tennessee and Louisville for Jordan Lovett. Speaking of West Virginia and North Harden, Lovett's three-star running back teammate Lavelle Wright, I'm pretty sure is going to choose West Virginia this week. So that'd be a nice little pickup for um, for the Mountaineers. Uh, Deontay Wright is coaching out there now, and he recruits Kentucky. He used to be at Western Michigan. So last year when you saw a bunch of Kentucky high school kids reporting Western Michigan offers. That was Deontay's doing. And uh, Deontay is doing a good job recruiting Kentucky for West Virginia because I'm pretty sure they're about to get Lavelle Wright, who is a 6'1", 215-pound power back, who's got a you know a lot of versatility. And um, so that would be a nice little pickup for West Virginia. West Virginia did just get a running back commit that was a Louisville target um, Jalen Anderson, I think is his name. I'm, the name is escaping me now. I got so many names jammed up in my head from doing this recruiting stuff for the last five years, but I'm pretty sure it's Jalen Anderson. He's from Perry, Ohio. He's a four-star. He committed to West Virginia, but I'm pretty sure they're taking two backs. So I don't think that really um, pushes Lavelle right out, and I think Lavelle is going to go ahead and make that decision and commit to West Virginia. Now, Braylon Oliver is another guy that the staff feels optimistic on. He's a number, was a number one rated player in South Carolina. He moved to Hoff out in Cornelius, North Carolina. Um, he blew up, got a bunch of big offers from some blue blood schools, you know, and uh, people kind of are doubting that. I, I personally am skeptical, but I'm told that the staff is high on him and they believe that they have a good shot and that, his head coach, his football coach down there in uh, South Carolina, who I, I don't know if it's a South Carolina or the North Carolina coach that they're talking about, um, which gives me more doubt about Oliver being, uh, you know, a lean towards Louisville. But uh, I was told that his head coach, whichever one it was, he's got a new head coach now, feels like Louisville's in a good spot. So take that for what it's worth. That's what I'm getting, um, if you ask me. I, I wouldn't put my pick in for him to Louisville right now, but I've been wrong before because I put in picks for Mal Glenn and Jack Dingle to Louisville, and they're both going to commit to Cincinnati. Anyway, um, the team needs that one recruit to commit and get things moving. If you were to guess within the next 60 days, who would that guy be? Uh, that's from Bardman. Well, Bardman, um, if – I don't know that that's how recruiting works um, with that one guy to commit. Maybe if it's a big time quarterback, then that might help you get a couple receivers and a running back and a tight end or a lineman or something like that. But um, I don't think that's how it works. Um, and uh, within the next 60 days, who would that guy be? Uh, let's say if anybody, it would be Corey Kiner from up there in Cincinnati because he's a four star but I don't know how much pool that kid has with other recruits. I don't know how popular he is. I don't know. I don't believe in all of this 
package deal hype that fans talk about. I think kids make decisions to go to school based upon what's best for them and not what other kids are doing. That's a common misconception within the industry, and, and I don't subscribe to that. Um, so, but I think the big name to commit, to answer your question, the big name to commit next would probably be Corey Kiner within the next 60 days. Is July 4th within the next 60 days? April, May, June, July. Let's, let's say it is. I don't know. Close to 60. Hangman Page joined April 8th, 2020. Welcome aboard, Hangman. Thanks for the question. He says, who are the schools who will be the most competition for Travion Ford? Well, that's Missouri and Illinois. And Jordan Dingle. Um, Ohio State. I'm, I'm told that. Jordan Dingle is a tight end from Bowling Green, plays for the Purples. He's a four-star tight end on Rivals. And I'm, I'm hearing that Ohio State is uh, – he's a take for them. But he has a really good relationship with Louisville. And Louisville has two tight ends. From what I'm hearing, uh, Vic Mullen, he's from Illinois. He's a high three-star, 5.7. And um, Jordan are the two top tight ends. They're taking two in his class, you know. Um, Jordan can play both H back and, and the Y tight end. And uh, Vic is more of a guy who is your Y guy, who means you kind of like tether to the line. He's your inline guy. And um, if, if Vic doesn't necessarily pan out a tight end, the staff believes that they can uh, CYA and move him to tackle. And he'll be an athletic tackle. They'll just have to beef him up. So they really like Vic Mullen for that reason. And they like Dingle because they feel like he could play H or Y. So they like him a lot as well. Um, but Ohio State <clears throat> is the big competition there. So if they can if they can beat Jordan Dingle for Ohio State, I mean, if they could beat Ohio State for Jordan Dingle, props, that's a big win right there. Don't let, don't let the Ohio State fans tell you he wasn't a take either because I got it on pretty good authority that, in fact, he is. All right. KWC Panthers, he asks, given the earlier period to be able to sign prospects in December, when should we start to worry about a lack of commits? Mm, I'd worry now, honestly. They only got two. And uh, there's another question about someone else asked about how they're doing in the ACC. Um, let me find that real fast. Bob West says, we have two commits. How do the other ACC schools stand? I want to get this tab out of the way. Well, here we go. North Carolina has 14. Clemson has nine. They just lost the number one player in the country, Corey Foreman. Miami has 11. But Miami tends to lose a bunch, too. So we'll see what happens with them. Vatech has six. FSU, five. Duke with eight. Virginia with six. Boston College with five. Pitt has three, NC State has four, Georgia Tech has three, Wake Forest has four, Louisville has two, Syracuse has three, Louisville is ranked 13th out of 14th. Um, there's your answer, man. I don't want to get too far into it. I don't want to get all mixed up like that, but that's how it is. I forgot to play Corey Kiner's video for y'all, so um, you know, it's something that I guess we should talk about. Uh, Corey is – a rivals 250 four star running back. So he would probably be the highest rated kid in this class that I can think of. Um, and he'd be a big win. Definitely a big win for Louisville if they could pull him. He's got a, a really good offer list. He's got, you know, Michigan offered him, Ohio State, LSU. Um, I, I'm not sure that he's necessarily a take at LSU right now, but I think that he'd be a take at Michigan for sure, although they are trying to get Donovan Edwards. But I've been told by some of my Big Ten people that Michigan – that they heard Michigan's looking for two backs. So that could very well be the case. And you see uh, Corey is a breakaway threat who, you know, one-cut type runner who would uh, really thrive in the zone read offense right there. You see that? See that one cut? See him find that hole and slither through there? That's exactly what you want in the in – the, type of zone blocking offense that Louisville runs. So he'd be a really good fit. Anyway, uh, Jay Hectus asks, 
How has the absence of camps affected Rivals' own ability to evaluate and rate prospects? Well, we have Rivals hasn't made any different moves. Okay, uh, 24/7 just released their new rankings. Uh, they said they based that on a couple of early camps, but they moved all the kids from the nation around, and they didn't have. I don't know that they had camps all over the nation, but um, I get it. You got to pay the bills. You got to change the rankings up. That's what the fans want to see. Um, and that's what they pay for. So I don't know what they're really, you know, maybe they're basing it on film, but there were no real, real, like the whole camp circuit was just getting underway when everything shut down. So it's incomplete evaluation process. Uh, it hurts. It hurts. Um, colleges evaluate camps, right? Um, college coaches use camps to evaluate guys. They can have three dudes that they really like and they only got one spot. Well, you get all three of them to campus, you measure them, you, you, you make them work out, see how fast they are, how far they can jump, how they take coaching, uh, how they respond to being on the campus, you know, um, how they compete against other players that are top level players. And that's the thing that hurts with the rivals camps because, you know, a rivals camp has more talent than say um, a Purdue camp because all the kids from the region are coming to that rivals camp to compete. Whereas some kids aren't going to go to a Purdue camp because they're looking at Ohio State, Michigan, and and uh, Clemson, right? So they're not going to go to the Purdue camp. So the Rivals camp has a lot of the top talent in the country. So when you have these regional camps, you get all the best kids from that area. Then when you go to – once you, this is Corey Kenner. I'm going to put this on while I talk about that. And then once you go to um, – the five-star challenge, you know, you've got a bunch of five stars out there competing against each other. And the same thing when you go to the opening, you know, you've got all these great players from a region going to these regional camps, trying to make it to that, you know, the, the big opening. And that's where all the top kids are. So you're seeing how they compete against one another. You're seeing who's the alpha male, who ducks away from the competition, who's not scared of anybody, you know, who who looks bigger standing next to this kid than that kid? Is that kid really 6'2", or is he 5'11"? You know, you get to do all that. So it hurts. It hurts the evaluation. You can't lie about it. And this could be a year where it, it, does, it goes beyond how it affects rivals' rankings. It could affect some P5 schools who, you know, end up losing a kid to, say, Toledo or Buffalo or, or Cincinnati or Memphis, and these kids go in the first round of the NFL draft because – you didn't get to evaluate them and they play at a small school out in somewhere like, you know, Pikeville and they end up blowing up because they couldn't come to your camp and you couldn't evaluate them firsthand. You know, a lot of people ask me, what do you think about this kid that you saw on film? Well, I'll tell you what, the kid looked good on film, right? But I don't know the level of competition that kid plays out in, you know, Juniper or wherever the kid lives. I don't know how good the kids are out there. Um, I don't know if he's really as big as he reported. He might look that way, but he might not um, be that actual height. He might be two inches shorter, which makes a difference when you're talking about anybody. Um, there's just so much that goes into the evaluation process. And when you take out such a big factor, like actually laying your eyes on the kid, uh, it, it hurts. No matter how anybody tries to spin it and tell you otherwise, it, that's bull crap. You want to you get eyes on a kid. You know, last thing you want is to take a recruit and take his commitment sight unseen who says he's a 5'10 nickel corner and he gets to campus and he's 5'7 and he's 10 pounds lighter than what he said he was, you know, because you could have got a guy that has better measurables. So it matters. It's going to affect everybody if we, uh, those of us who do this type of stuff, can't actually get to lay eyes on a kid. Sometimes you guys will ask me, well, what do you think about this kid? And my my response will be, I never saw the kid in person, so I can't really give you an accurate assessment of the kid. You know, he looks good on film. That's not me trying to duck putting my take out there. It's it's an honest response. It's like it would be irresponsible for me to say, oh, this kid's better than that kid or that kid if I didn't get any eyes on him. Some kids you could just tell, right? I mean, if I'm watching Joey Bosa's film, I don't need to see Joey Bosa in person. <laughs> I'm seeing him throw dudes around and killing everybody on film. Like, that just looks way different than anybody else on film, right? That's a no-brainer. But when we're talking about three-star kids, um, there's not a lot separating those kids that are in that range, right? There, it's just maybe one or two different things that you find out about them, and that's why evaluation is so important, and that's why camp matters.
uh, so that that pretty much answers that question for uh, Jay Hectus. Um, Card for Life wants to know: um, Do I expect a commitment or two before the month wraps up? Um, Derek Edwards was a guy I thought was going to commit. I got a commitment story written up for him in the draft, so I think he might be the next one to pop. I think Walker Wood, the kid I was telling you, or Braylon Wood from um, Colorado, not Walker Wood, Braylon Wood from Colorado. He could be a guy that jumps on board. Um, Jordan Williams, I believe there's a question on here. Here we go. So here we go. Let's, let's segue into this one. What's the scoop on the wide receiver you and Chad Simmons put your forecast in for? Uh, is this kid any good? Does this eliminate us from Amari Huggins Bruce? Um, no. Uh, here's why. Uh, let me find – Jordan's film. Well, to your first question, is he any good? Yes, he's good. He's a three star. He has offers from a lot of big time schools. I believe he has Alabama. So there you go. At least he was offered by Alabama. Not sure if he's a take. Might have been a camp offer. But yeah, I mean, the kid's good. He does what Louisville likes. He can stretch the field. He's a tough kid. Uh, I think he doesn't have any problem throwing his uh, face mask in the, into the secondary to block, you know. Uh, he can he can do different things. He can catch the screen. He can beat you downfield. He's he's got some wiggle to him, but um, I don't know that he's necessarily going to commit uh, today. Actually, I'm pretty sure he's taking a virtual tour today. Uh, but the thing with Louisville's receivers are man, that's a nasty route right there. Oof, hit him with the head fake. I don't know why he cut that screen, though. He cut the – you see how he cut that screen right there? He might have dropped that ball or fumbled or something. <laughs> That's suspect, kid. But um, I like the kid. I think he's good. I just think Louisville's number one target is Amari Huggins-Bruce to play that slot position. And I think that's the guy that they're kind of focused on. Does that create a bird in the hand, two in the bush kind of situation? Uh, without question, it does. But who knows, you know, uh, Brew is the wide receiver coach. Brew's got a huge board full of kids. And, you know, who knows Who knows what he likes. I, only thing I know is that Huggins Bruce is the number one guy. Um, and those two, these two players are, are going to play that same slot position. They're going to play the 2-2 Atwell slot. So I think they want Huggins Bruce there. So, it could be a kind of like if, if Williams wants to jump on board right now, I think Louisville might tell him, you know, hey, man, we really like you, but uh, I want to get you on campus and I want to get Huggins Bruce on campus to kind of evaluate both of y'all, measure y'all up for the reasons I said before, which are you got two guys that are kind of equal. You want to find out, well, what's the thing that distinguishes one from the other? So he could jump on a day. He could be the next commitment. He really could. But if not, um, it's probably because the staff can't really decide between the two guys and, and they want to, they wanna, you know, get to see him in person. So not everybody's just going to take a commitment right now. You know, it's just, it's just not how it goes. You know, you got a whole country full of kids right now. It's still early. But I think Jordan, I think Louisville's in a good spot for this kid. I think he's a good player. And um, – it just remains to be seen who they want. Now, someone asked me about this kid, Isaiah Brevard. Uh, he dropped his top 10. Um, do we have a realistic chance with this Isaiah Brevard kid? I see we're in the top 10. Um, I mean, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I think Brevard has uh, got his mindset on going to an SEC school. He's from Mississippi. It's usually really hard to pull the kid out. Of, I think he's from Mississippi. Is he from Alabama? Yeah, he's from Mississippi. So it's hard to pull a Mississippi kid out of Mississippi that has offers from Ole Miss or Mississippi State. It's happened. It happens. But um, – and Ole Miss just got a, a commit. So – I just think he's going to the SEC. I think if he don't go there, I think if Florida wants him, they're, they're a possibility. I'm not sure that he's in there, that Florida's in the top five. Um, I, I really didn't – I know it sounds like I don't know what I'm talking about right now, but it's because I don't think that this kid is a realistic option for Louisville anyway. 
So I really haven't been paying much attention. So that'll answer that question for you right there. Uh, will we continue to recruit Dunn? Yes. Um, I think that's it. I think we, I think we ran through this. Um, I don't really have anything else. Likelihood of landing uh, Kiner. I would imagine the summer commitment date works in our favor. I think there's a very good likelihood. And um, I think that that summer commitment date does work in Louisville's favor. Daniel Edwards popping for the card soon. I already discussed that. Uh, what should the benchmark? Okay, so card fan 59, he asks, what should the benchmark for us as a program for where we should finish nationally in the recruiting rankings? 30, 40? Uh, you want to finish in the top 20s at least. You know, uh, 30 is a little – it's a little high right now. It'd be good. I mean, you know, they finished 40th or something like that last year. That's too low. Um, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of kids on there that only had one offer from a P5 school, which was Louisville. So, you know, you kind of want to beat out power five schools, not, you know, G5 schools for your players. It's okay to have a few of those dudes, like, you know, two or three, that's, that's fine. But, you know, when you're, when you're up there in the twenties, that means you're, you're beating out, teams in your conference for players. Now, coaches will tell you, I don't care what another coach thinks. I'm going to take the guys that I like that fit my system. But, you know, um, all right, coach, if you say so. <laughs> uh, but a lot of coaches won't even offer a kid until that kid has another power five offer or offer from that level. So, you know, it depends on what coach you talk to and who you are as far as the media. And it also matters who's listening to what that coach says. But, you, you know, you want to be in the top 20. You want to be beating out um, Miami and Virginia Tech and, and Virginia and, and uh, teams of that nature, you know. And then once you start beating those teams out, then you move up to fighting for, you know, top 10, top 10 to 19 ranking where you're going up against the Tennessees of the world and, and beating them out for dudes. And then next thing you know, you're up there fighting against Ohio State and Clemson and them. So it's, it's a gradual process. I think this year you want to see Louisville finish. I think 30 will be fine. You know, you want to see improvement. You want to see like a tier jump. To me, a tier is five team blocks, you know. So they finish 40, 35, they, they jump, a, you know, a tier. But you'd prefer to see them jump to, you know, like number 30. That would be a good uh, uh, landing spot for them in this class. And then, you know, you want to see 25, 20, you know, and, and so on and so forth. So that, that's what it is for there. From your point of view, K, KWC Panthers, my, uh, my most active member here, he was always asking me a bunch of questions and it's very much appreciated. Good questions usually, uh, most always. From the point of view, from my point of view, what are the top three position groups that need an influx of talent and depth the most? And he also says, I love these videos. This is why I pick. Thank you for that. Uh, the top three position groups, like I said before, safety, because there's only going to be three. You're going to have uh, Jack Fago, Josh Minkins, and Lovey Jenkins playing safety for you in 2021. So they definitely need um, talent and depth there. I mean, depth and is, is definitely the problem. Um, inside linebacker, you're losing a lot. You lost Katavian Franks last year. And um, so you're going to need to put some talent there and some depth there. You're going to lose uh, Etheridge. So you got to find some guys to play those positions because, you know, Louisville runs, you know, kind of like a 3-4 with that card being kind of like your, your, uh, your rover type guy who's, um, you know, a strong safety outside linebacker type. But the two inside linebackers are crucial. So you're going to need two inside linebackers. And, and then D.N., you know, they're going to need DN. You know, DN is the most important position on defense because it turns the clock up on the quarterback, and that means that the corners and the safeties and the linebackers don't have to cover as long. Plus, you know, you get a chance to get turnovers and you get sacks, and then they punt the ball away. And that's what you want. You want DNs. They're going to need some good rush DNs. They're going to get the pressure on the quarterback. Um, the way their defense works, you know, the way they're – their strategy is, you know, they want to score a bunch of points and force you to throw the ball because they don't have, you know, the big guys on the D line that can stuff the run. So they want to put some points up on you quick and then force you to throw the ball and they want to turn the heat up on you with a D end. So 
that's what they need. Uh, I'd say number one, they need to, I'd say safety just from a number standpoint, but I'd say from a talent standpoint, you always need more DNs every single year. You need it. Doesn't matter who you are. You know, you can ask that question to anybody. They need DNs. They need DNs, DN, DN. Because you can rotate these guys. You want your, your, you want your edge rushers fresh. So, you know, the more depth and talent you have at DN, the more of a threat you are to bring the pressure on the quarterback and speed the whole the whole clock up on the offense to where the decision making has to come crisp and instinctive and you're not getting chances to make uh second and third reads in the run game, you know, so definitely D end um, safety and inside linebacker. Um, anyway, that's where we're at with it. That answers all your questions. Oh, wait, somebody on Twitter asked me something and I wanted to see what they were talking about. Hold on one second while I pull this up. All right, James Middleton asks me, uh, seems like we're losing a lot of recruits that were high on coming to Louisville. What's happening that we are not sealing the deal? Um, I also see a lot of commits rolling in and out. Seems quiet for Louisville. Is this quarantine hurting us more than other schools? Well, um, you lost Mal Glenn, who's a guard and Louisville has a lot of kids they're targeting already at guard. So, I mean, I wouldn't really worry about that too much. Um, to quote uh, uh, Jim Lachey, he used to play for the Washington Redskins. He's a Hall of Famer. He said, you can, you can find any, any bum off the street and teach him to play guard. <laughs> um, so, you know, it is what it is. Plus the kids from Cincinnati. And I think the, the COVID thing kind of played into the family dynamic there where, you know, they said, let's just stay home. Um, so who knows? That kid might even open it back up once he can go, uh, once this thing subsides and the family says, okay, you can go to Louisville. From what I heard, he was dead set to go to Louisville. But the family kind of got worried about the virus stuff, and then he went to Cincinnati. That could just be spin. I don't know. That's what I was told. That's what I'm telling you. Um, Jack Dingle going to Cincinnati is because he is – his dad went there, his brother went there, and he feels like he'll get a chance to start there earlier than he would at Louisville, which I don't know if, if that's necessarily the case. But he's going to Cincinnati, so – you lost a local kid who's not really – you lost a local kid at Trinity to Cincinnati, but that kid is a Cincinnati legacy whose older brother, who's two years ahead of him, plays there now too. So is that that's not really like you're losing a hometown kid to Cincinnati. It's more like you lost a Cincinnati legacy to Cincinnati who lived in Louisville and played at Trinity. So, I mean, I don't really know who else you could be talking about. Um, there have been a couple players, you know, that weren't really necessarily super high on Louisville's board. Uh, Gunnar Greenwald committed to USF over Miami and some other schools, you know, in Louisville. But I mean, who, who picks USF over, over, you know, power five options, you know, so maybe those weren't really options. Maybe they just were kind of like camp offers and there's no camp. So he decided, you know, I'm going to save my spot at USF. Um, I don't know, man. I mean, it's tough. It's it's not ideal for teams like Louisville not to be able to get kids on campus. And to a, a greater extent, see the city. Because, you know, Louisville sells kids on, you know, look, you're going to live in a city. You're not going to be out in the boondocks somewhere. You know, this isn't the middle of nowhere. This isn't still water. <laughs> you know, this is Louisville. We're a real city. We have a downtown. We have stuff going on. We have – a lot of cool restaurants. We have culture. We have, you know, 1.5 million people here. So it's, it's different than a lot of other programs recruiting where, you know, if you're, if you're LSU, you're LSU, right? If you're Clemson, you're Clemson. You really don't have to get a kid on campus. The kid's pretty much sold. They're just waiting for you. They're just waiting for those big time schools to say, okay, you're a take jump on board. Teams that it, it hurts though, it, teams like Nebraska, who, you know, may not have been good since the 90s. But, man, when you go out to Nebraska to that, to that campus and you see how the football players are treated, it's an eye-opening experience, and they get some guys off of that. So I think it, I think it hurts them that they can't get kids here to Louisville to check out the city. You know, 
to, to experience that kind of uh, culture that, that goes on here to bring them to the basketball games is a big part of what they do at Louisville. Um, they did that in February and March, but that, that's done now. Um, so, yeah, it hurts some schools. It doesn't hurt others, but it's, you know, it's something that you're going to have to overcome, and hopefully it's over soon and we all get back to normal. So we'll see. I mean, it's challenging times. Um, but yeah, I would say, I would say Louisville is hurting. I'd say the COVID-19 shutdown is hurting Louisville more than it's hurting, um, some schools, you know, is it hurting them as much as it's hurting Georgia Tech? Uh, I would say it's hurting them more than Georgia Tech because Georgia Tech is in Georgia. It's in Atlanta. These kids have already been to Georgia Tech and seen that area. And, you know, Louisville recruits a lot of kids from there. So, Georgia Tech gets the advantage because the kids in that area have been there, whereas those kids haven't been to Louisville yet. So, yeah, I think that it, it's hurting Louisville. You know, it hurts any team like Louisville. Oregon, it should probably hurt people. Nebraska, um, to an extent Oklahoma, uh, because there aren't a lot of kids, you know, within a 100-mile radius of the campus that they're recruiting. You know, so if you're, if you're located in a fertile recruiting hotbed, you're going to have an advantage over a school that's not when prospects can't travel. So that's it. That's all the questions for this week. Uh, thanks for joining us. We will be back. I'll be back next week um, with the same stuff. So I'll post something else on the uh, board for you guys to ask me questions and y'all fill them up and I will come back and answer them. Thank you for subscribing and thanks for tuning in.